Thank you so much for joining us today for the message. As always, I want to encourage you to make sure that you are planted in a local church um, wherever you live so that you are able to serve and worship together with others. But we do pray that our church is a great resource to you and many others. And if our church has been a blessing to you, I would encourage you to join us in financially giving so that we can continue to provide resources just like today's message as well as many other things abroad. Thank you again. God bless. The Lord's Prayer is at the very center of the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe that's intentional in many ways. Uh, at the core of who we are as Christians is that we're able to come to God and have relationship with him. And we're able to say our father, which is something extremely powerful that I think a lot of times we take for granted. But let's read the prayer together because he starts off by telling us in verse five through eight that not to pray like the hypocrites. and Don't pray like the Gentiles. The hypocrites just wanna be seen. The Gentiles believe that of all the different gods that they serve, they believe that if with a bunch of words and a bunch of phrases, mindlessly praying that they can get what they want and God's over here saying, verse eight, I already know what you need in advance. He's inviting us to relationship. He's inviting us to change our hearts, to change our perspectives. He's inviting us to make a difference in the world. And so in verse nine, he says to pray like this. Like this, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And that is the word of the Lord this morning. Did you notice something? And every week it's kind of like we're bringing up different topics. Uh, first three petitions are to God. The last three petitions are for ourselves and for our fellow man, right? It's very similar in nature to what? The Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, right? The first, what, four are directed specifically towards God. You shall have no other gods before me, and then so on and so forth. Then it goes into relationship between what? First, honor our father and mother, and then from there, how are we to treat one another? And so it's a relationship between God and our relationship between one another, which is what? Matthew 22, what is the great command? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and second, love your neighbor as yourself. And the law and the prophets can be summed up in these two commands. And so what we find in the structure of the Lord's Prayer is very much like the Ten Commandments. Get our relationship right with God, get our perspective right with God, and then from what? From there, then we begin to ask with a right heart and a right mind towards the things that we need, which is where we will pick up today. Notice one of the things, though, that we find here. It's, it's not my Father in heaven, and it's not to say that individualize it, but it's intended to be a communal prayer. But, you know, there's a lot of people that say, well, I can worship Jesus just as good while watching on television. No, you can't. I can, I can worship Jesus just as good while watching it on my computer or watching it. And a lot of times that's a good substitute. Can I say it like that? Can I, I wanna make sure it's very clear for our people and maybe for you watching online. It's a great substitute maybe if there's no other way under the sun that you could possibly make it. But it will never ever compare to the real thing of being in the presence of God with the people of God because our Father in heaven, that's how you're to pray it which is the understanding that we're praying that together. Our Father, give us our daily bread. It's not my daily bread, which helps me better understand. I'm not just praying for my needs, I'm also praying for you. Remember what he says, Paul, in chapter four of Ephesians? He says, let the thief no longer steal, rather let him work hard with his hands so that he can provide for others in need. Not only are you not supposed to steal anymore, if maybe that's what you were into beforehand, you're not just supposed to work for yourself and for the betterment of you alone. It's for the betterment of the people of God, which also impacts what? You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You see, it's, it's not just you in isolation. This is what our problem for so much of America is. It, it's all about me and my journey and what's going on. It's not about you. It's not about me. And that selfish, narcissistic mentality and attitude 
will have no place in our church or any church for that matter that's honestly trying to be biblical. I mean, that's why we encourage it so much and really put a hard line on it as a member. We're part of life groups. We're part of community. For those who just want to attend, we love you. We're glad you're here. But as a member and one that we're holding accountable and encouraging one another, be there and be in community because you can't say this prayer in the fullness thereof when it says our Father because you have to be saying it alone. It was never intended to be that way. There's a quote that says this, there may be religions that come to you through the quiet walks in the woods or while sitting quietly in a library with a book or rummaging around the recesses of your psyche. Christianity is not one of them. Christianity is inherently communal, a matter of life in the body, the church. Jesus did not call isolated individuals to follow him. He called a group of disciples. I, I wanna say that again. He called you out of darkness not to live an individual life or individual walk. You will not be successful as a follower of Christ going at it alone. You will not be. You may struggle your way through it. You may toss and turn. Your feet may be moving. But it is the church that God has chosen as his instrument, as his vessel for the people of God to work through. It is not man's idea. It is Christ's church, Matthew 16. On this, I will build, what does Jesus say? My church. On this rock, I will build my church. And so this morning, we're going to talk about specifically verse 11. Look at it once again. Give us, so is, am I included in the us? Yes, but so are you. A lot of times we feel like, well, it really doesn't matter what I do because what I do is what I do and it's private, it's personal, and it's not anyone else's business. What you do impacts the body. If you throw a rock and smoke your toe, does the rest of your body hurt? And do you shout? Do you utilize your mouth to express the pain? Absolutely you do. And so when some of you say, it doesn't really matter that I'm living in sin or engaging in these things or continually being an isolationist because I just don't wanna make the time to do what I need to do. It doesn't matter, and the answer is you are wrong. And we love you enough as a church, and I know enough churches ought to love you enough, but we'll love you enough to say, hey, why are you doing that? Because you're hurting the church rather than helping. Give us this day our daily bread. Point number one this morning, if you're taking home, is this. We are to ask for our needs to be met by our Father. And some of you probably are saying, that is so simple, why would you even put that as a point? Because sometimes the simple things need to be brought into our awareness. There's a lot of us sitting in here this morning with great needs and we never bring them before God. We never even mention them. Some of us are going through needs and we never ever let anyone around us know any of the things that we're going through because we're what? Never gonna let anyone know that I'm weak. I'm never gonna let anyone know that I have a need. I'm never gonna let anyone into my life. I'm never gonna be vulnerable. I'm never gonna let them know what I'm struggling with without even realizing it, they're struggling too. Everyone in this room in some form and fashion, I'm not saying your world's completely falling apart. By God's grace, it's not for most of us. But every single person in this room has things that they are working through, struggling with, fighting for, weaknesses that are there and are apparent to those who are close to them. But here's the deal again. If you will not let people get close to you, nobody will ever know. And then if no one knows, how will they pray? And if no one's praying, do we not think that our Father in heaven hears us? Do we not take Jesus at his word? That was the first song, was it not? We'll, we'll take you at your word. We believe your promises, right? He tells us to pray again and again and again maybe for the people in the back. And again, he tells us to pray because it's powerful. He tells us to pray because he died so that we could have this communion with God, our Father. He tells us to pray because our Father hears us. He tells us to pray because there is so much in your life and in my life that you cannot accomplish apart from God's working in your life. It's not possible. 
There's so much in your life that you cannot accomplish. And I'll tell you another thing. Let's say it another way. If everything in your life is all that you're able to accomplish and none of it is bathed in prayer, that's a very shallow life to live, especially to, being, to be claiming a Christian. Think about how much we're missing out on if you're doing everything in your own strength. I mean, just seriously, think just for a moment. If your life is a sum total of your ingenuity, your abilities, your strength, and you being able to finagle things, think how much you are missing out when it comes to God's relationship with you and the enjoyment of the journey along the way. Heavenly Father awaits people to pray, to confess their need, to come to him. In an agrarian culture, especially where most of these people are day laborers and they get paid a very meager sum, if they were not able to work because they were sick or because of drought or because of some type of thing happening, I mean, they could literally die within a very short period of time. And so when Jesus says, pray this prayer to pray for our daily bread, I mean, this is important to them. Because the word here is a bit ambiguous as far as what daily means. So if you pray this prayer in the morning, and you should, then that means prayer for today. But if you pray that prayer as well at night, then you're also praying for tomorrow's bread. So in your Bibles, most of your Bibles, if you look at the very bottom, it's gonna have like a number by it, or it's gonna have a letter by it. And it's gonna say it can also be read as for tomorrow's bread. That's what it's going to say because it's not only for this day's bread, but it's also future looking for the provision of tomorrow's bread. And so when we pray this prayer, we're speaking about today, but we're also speaking about the future and the fact that God is a God who loves to provide for his people. That God, he even provides for who? It says that God provides for the wicked and the righteous alike. It, God provides, he's so good that he provides for people who give him no glory, who could care less about him, who curse his name on a daily and still allows the sun and the rain to come their way still gives them an opportunity for breath, still gives them an opportunity to live a life. It's insane how the love of God is poured out on people. Now, Jesus' Jewish audience would have easily been able to show us or would have been easily able to see that he's talking about Exodus 16 as well. Exodus 16, for many of you, it's what? The manna in the wilderness. Now, I want you to notice something and read it later, maybe today. In Exodus 16, Look for how many times in your Bible it says grumbling or grumble. It's like seven, eight, maybe nine times. It's a lot in a very short period. And it says that the people of Israel were only 15 days removed. Y'all following this? Two weeks, 15 days removed from all of the plagues, all of the powerful signs that God showed in Egypt, delivering them from Pharaoh from the most powerful nation in the world. And they didn't fight with sword. They didn't fight with spear. They didn't have horses. They didn't have nothing. They just trusted in their God. He delivered them. Then Pharaoh and his army, what's left of them, comes after him at the Red Sea, and then he drowns all of them, Exodus 14. They've seen all of this. 15 days removed, they're grumbling. And they're thinking back about slavery in Egypt and how good it was and how good they had it and the food that they ate and all this. And it's like you're romanticizing the slavery that you're in. And is that not a picture sometimes of our life? Man, I remember the days when I used to go out and I used to do this. And man, I used to drink all of that and I used to partake in all that. And we start romanticizing our slavery. And God's over here saying, I delivered you so that you could live. The whole Sermon on the Mount is about human flourishing for us as followers of Christ. That's really what we're getting at in the Beatitudes and the prayer and all the above. It's incredible when you think about it. And so when we look at this, he gives manna from heaven. He says, I'm going to provide for them. Moses is, of course, like, how, how, how in the world are you going to provide for all these people? He's going to send down manna from heaven. And they said, what is this? He says, every day. Whether you gather a lot or a little, everybody had something to eat. Paul uses that same illustration in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 or 9, one of the two. There's some of us in here that's able to gather a lot. There's some of us in here able to gather a little, but when we put all of our resources together, everybody has what? Everybody has enough when properly distributed. Ministry takes place when properly distributed. Ministries abroad take place, right? All these different things. And so when we look at this, Six days in the week, 
they were to gather, but on the sixth day, they were to gather twice as much. Five of those days, they were to do what? Gather just enough for the night, not any, nothing was gonna be left over. Well, why could nothing be left over? So they wouldn't be hoarders. Now again, look at our own lives, look at my life. There's a lot. And what is Jesus teaching them? What is God teaching them during this season? To trust him, that he'll provide for them for tomorrow. He'll provide provision for tomorrow. That they can depend on him, that he's good, that he's faithful, that he'll keep his word. On the sixth day, however, he was gonna provide a double portion for them and it wasn't gonna go bad. No maggots, no bugs overnight. It was going to what? So that they could have a day of, come on church, rest. They could have a day of rest so that they could realize your life is not the sum total of what your possession. That's Luke 12, 15, that's Jesus speaking. Your life is not the sum total of, of that which you have or the title that you have or any of the above. Your life and your purpose is tied into do you know the creator? Do you know God? That is the ultimate for every single one of us here this morning and for all who have ever lived. Do you know God? Kids ask for things when they need it and they don't hesitate. I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago. Beckham, who is three and a half, will ask for anything. Now, most of which I'm not getting him because it's all things I can't afford. A track hoe, a truck, a Jeep, a, I mean, tractors. I mean, he wants anything. When we're driving down the road to take him to uh, whoever's watching him, maybe for the day, anything that drives by that catches his attention. Oh, I want that, dad. I want that truck, dad. I want that 18-wheeler, dad. I want... He names off everything, and I'm just like, sure, man. <laughs> sure thing. We'll try for it, right? but he doesn't hesitate to ask. We've been so programmed that we won't ask for hardly anything even when we need help. Even when we need help, we still, in many cases, won't ask. I looked up a, um, an article in the Harvard Business Review and it says, why it's so hard, this was the title, why it's so hard to ask for help. And there was several reasons in there. Fear of being vulnerable. Fear of being vulnerable was one of them. The need to be independent. I'm my own man, I'm my own woman. I don't need anyone. I pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I don't owe anybody anything, nothing, right? The fear of losing control, the fear of being rejected, that they don't wanna be bothersome. So why do so many Christians have trouble bringing their needs before God? Why do so many Christians have trouble when it comes to asking for your needs, when we say our daily bread, we're, we're really saying, Lord, I'm praying for the needs that I have in my life. I bet it's very similar to the list that was just given. Maybe you have your own, but I bet it was very similar because, well, what I've got to bring to God is just so small in relative comparison to so many other people. Do you think God has a limit on what to do in his provision for you in your life? I mean, do you think that? Do you think that if he helps you that he can't help them? Of course not, of course not. Do you feel like because you prayed for it from years past that maybe it's just time to let go and, but it's still on your heart? Keep praying. Don't forget John the Baptist's parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. God answered them in their what? Later in life. Don't forget about Abraham and Sarah, God answered them later in life. Again and again in scripture, it tells us, whether it through stories or through explicitly Jesus himself in all the New Testament, that we are to pray. James 4, 2 says this, you do not have because you do not ask. Paul Miller, I love how he says this, prayer is asking God to incarnate, to get dirty in your life. Yes, the eternal God scrubs floors. For sure we know he washes feet. So take Jesus at his word, ask him. Tell him what you want, get dirty, write out your prayer request. Don't mindlessly drift through life on the American narcotic of busyness. If you try to seize the day, the day will eventually break you. Seize the corner of his garment and don't let go until he blesses you. He will reshape the day. I like that, man. I like that. Seize the corner of his garment. You remember 
the reference, a woman who had been bleeding for over 12 years and no physician and all of her money had been expended. No one could heal her. The best of the best in the world at the time could not do anything. And she thought, if I could just touch the edge of his garment, if I could just get to him. You know what that took? No pride. Absolute vulnerability. Absolutely, I don't care what anyone thinks. I don't care about the shame. I don't care about the ridicule. I don't care about being unclean. I don't care about any of the above. If I can just get to Jesus. Do you even remotely feel that way today? Is that even, is that even in the ballpark? of where some of us sit today. That might be the whole message for today for someone. Do you even remotely, do I even remotely have that type of yearning for Jesus? For he tells us in one chapter over, Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks. And everyone who seeks will find, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if he has a son, asks for, asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, notice, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? You who are evil, and you're like, man, he must have been pointing somebody out. Nope. All of us. You who are evil. And you're like, mm, well, nope. That's Jesus. All sinners. All in need of redemption. All in need of reconciliation with God. He said, if we know how to give good gifts to our kids, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give you good gifts? How much more? Which leads me, secondly, about not only our daily needs, but number two, praying for, praying for God's provision is aligning ourselves with reality. It's aligning ourselves. It's a lot of times when we pray, it, it doesn't say that God's saying, well, I don't know what you need. You ever do that at Christmas time? Some of y'all are like really wild. September is here, and some of y'all are like, I've already started my list. You know, I've, I've already started buying the stuff. That way, when December rolls around, I'm not gonna be stressed, right? I mean, some of you are on top of your game. I'm more like the, I want the sale around December 24th kind of deal, um, gift card, uh, a note, not even a real one. I just, I like, I make my notes, they're homemade, which means they're more meaningful at times, right? I mean, and that's kind of where I fall in the ballpark. Some of you are overdoers, I love it. Uh, that's a good thing for most people, uh, but you know, a lot of times, like, we're, we're thinking, and we don't know what to give. You ever ask somebody, what do you want? I mean, Christmas now has become, for most of our family, especially on Erica's side of the family, like, you know what you're getting. It's almost like you went with them and picked it out, and you're like, yeah, exactly that one. That size, that shape, yep, that T-shirt right there. That's the one. Because it's like, there's no surprise. There's no surprise anymore at all. And, uh, and, and it's the same way for, like, birthdays or other things like that. It's like, you don't even, you know. But still, there's some people out there that are like, no, I need to know, what do you want? What would really make you happy? You know, what would be in the direction? God's not asking you. He already knows what you need. He already knows the innermost desires in your heart. He already knows everything about you, right? He knows. When we pray, what's happening there? Our hearts are being changed because first and foremost, we're going to God in prayer getting our perspective right, the first three petitions, and then we begin to say, God, but here's the things that I need in my life. You know what this does for us a lot of times? It brings awareness. It brings awareness to our dependency upon God. It brings awareness to our need. It brings awareness to our weaknesses. There's some of you out here right now, you have physical ailments in your body and the doctor still can't tell you what's wrong with you. There are some of you still out here right now that are going through stuff internally and you can't even tell it's that bad yet until it gets really bad. Like God knows. We're to pray. We're to come to him. When we pray, we are declaring our dependence upon him. And I, that can't be stressed enough. 
That cannot be stressed enough that we in every shape and form are dependent upon God every single day. We are dependent upon God. Do you ever consider the abundance in your life? I just wanna ask you that question. Do you ever consider that? So when we pray, in the midst of it, we're also thanking, are we not? We're thanking God for all that he has done. That's Philippians 4, 6, right? Prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, like we're bringing our requests to God, but with thanksgiving, with expectancy, with reflection of all that he's done, right? We're thinking about all those things. I just ask the question again, do you ever consider the abundance in your life? Some of you are like, well, you're, you were born. That's a gift. I, I know that a lot of us that were just like, well, I mean, that's just, that was a given. No, it was a gift. You were born. You are breathing right now. And you're not forcing it to occur. Like, you're breathing. That's a gift. You woke up this morning. You have a body that functions. Maybe not in every single faculty of it, but it functions, right? It works. You have friends, you have family, you have food. It's hard to relate to daily bread when most of our refrigerators and freezers and pantries are full of a week plus. But you got that. You're provided for. And the thing is, y'all ever think about it, food tastes good. And y'all are all like, this is, like, Josh, you were the, the simplest person I've ever met in my life. Food didn't have to taste good. The earth didn't have to have color. It didn't. I mean, if you've ever been anywhere outside of the northern part of Louisiana, you'll, you'll know that there's a whole wide world out there. And it's beautiful. So many colors and so many different parts to the world and so many different foods and so many different tastes and so many different things and everything, we're reading that in our life group this week, Psalms 19. The heavens declare the glory of God. Day by day pours forth speech to you. Are you ever thankful for the abundance in your life? Your clothing, your shelter, your transportation, your career, the leisure that you have. I was at a funeral and it was, a, it was not an easy funeral, praying for my dad all week long for the lady who was, who was shot next door to us here. And, and one, her niece came up and spoke during the funeral and she was loosely quoting maybe something that I think um, Miss Joyce said. And it was something along the lines of, you, you can choose to either see your glass half full or half empty. Right, I mean, we, we've heard that before. You can choose to see your glass half full or half empty and that's, a lot of us are questioning today, where are you, what are you looking through? What lens are you looking through? Half full, half empty. She said, but at the end of the day, just be thankful you have a cup. And I was like, oh. Are you thankful? Are you a thankful person? Are you grateful for what you have? It's very easy to get out of that mood very quickly. Very easy. Spoke to another lady this week, and I absolutely love her heart. And she was just telling me, she's like, I, I want to be a part of this church. I love this church. I'm, I want to be a member. I want to join. I, I just want to let you know that. And I'm like, I'm excited. I'm just pumped. They've been connected here over the years through life groups. They've, over time, have been coming a little bit more and a little bit more. And just like, I, I just want to be, I want to be here. It's, there's just so much joy. There's so much excitement. There's, it's alive. I just, I really just love it here. And I'm over here just like, Amen and amen and amen. Are you ever just thankful that God has given us a church family like he's given us? And you're just like, man, I look forward to Sundays or I look forward to Wednesdays or I look forward to my life group or I just, I enjoy it, man. Do y'all ever just do that? Because if you don't do that, you should be doing that, man. This is, this is unique what God is, is doing. Nothing special about us, but unique what God is doing, creating a family that unites together at the foot of the cross. We were talking about it at our staff meeting on Tuesday. And, and two of our staff members have been at multiple churches before and they were just like, don't take for granted the fact that God has given us such a united staff and a united church. Don't, don't take that for granted because the other churches we've been at have not been anything like that. Do you ever just say, thank you, Lord, 
for bringing me and making me a part of something that is, there is joy, there is expectancy, there is life. God is there among his people. I think it's such a beautiful thing. For James 1.17 says this, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change, which is another way of saying God gives good gifts throughout all of eternity, throughout all of history, and that's not going to change. God's not an emotional wreck, and God's not picking and choosing. He's saying, I give everyone good gifts. Everyone, good gifts. Every good thing you have in your life was given to you by God. So when you begin to pray about your daily needs, you also are able to reflect and be like, God, you've been so good to me. You've been so kind to me. You've been so gracious to me. You've been so patient with me. I mean, there's some of us out here just like, I would have given up on me a long time ago. Can we get an amen this morning? Yeah, like, I would have given up on me a long time ago, or I would have given up on you a long time ago, but God never gave up on you. God is working in and through your life for the better. Everything good is a gift from God. Ingratitude, I'll say it this way, is an insult to God. Ingratitude is an insult to God. Like, it's not even to say I hate what I got. It's just simply to never say thank you for what you've been given. You're following that this morning? It, it's not just to say, well, I just hate everything in my life and I'm just so sick of it and everybody else has everything and I don't. It's not even to say that. It's just simply to never say, thank you. It, it's not to ever wake up in the morning to say, Lord, thank you for this day. How many of y'all, I pray most of you don't raise your hands. How many of you woke up this morning and stepped foot outside and said, praise the Lord for 66, 65 degree weather out there this morning? I mean, have y'all not looked at the week ahead as far as the temperatures go? I mean, amen, we live in Louisiana. It's been horrible for a little bit. Like, it's exciting, and you're just like, why are you excited? Why not? Why not find a reason to be thankful every day? Why not have joy in your life? Why not get excited about the little things? Why not be more like Jesus? Proverbs 30, verse seven through nine says it this way. It's in your worship, God. Two things I ask of you. Deny them not to me before I die. Remove far from me falsehood and lying. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that is needful for me, lest I be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and still and profane the name of my God. That's, Tie that right in there to verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Two things I ask. Don't make it to where I forget you. Because if I've forgotten you, I have nothing. I don't care how much it says I have in a bank account or anything else. If I have not you, I have nothing. But Lord, provide for my needs so that I would not defame your name, hallowed be your name. Think about it. Think about it. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, again in your worship, God, give thanks in how many circumstances, church? Come on, a little bit louder. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. J.D. talked about it last week, right? What's the will of God? What's the will of God? Well, here's part of the will of God, that you would rejoice in all circumstances, figuring out a way, finding a way, fighting through a way to say, God, you are good, even if everything around me is not. You are good. You are good, because it all does what it points us to the future, which leads me to my third and close. Requesting our daily bread is ultimately an expression of our spiritual hunger for God's presence. That's ultimately what's happening here. Ultimately what we're focusing on and what we're going towards, it's the hunger spiritually for God's presence. I couldn't have planned it this way and I'm definitely not smart enough to do it all these weeks out, 
But it so happened to fall. This text so happened to fall when we were taking the Lord's Supper, which we take every second Sunday. And I just began to read as I was studying this week, and I was like, every single thing points it points to the table. It points to the taking. And the table points us back to Jesus and points us to our heavenly feast that will be in his presence one day. See, when I mentioned earlier and I said that our daily can mean either today's bread or tomorrow's bread, in this sense, it's the future. Praying for our daily bread is also praying for our spiritual sustenance that we would be filled and would be full. We're physical beings, but we're also spiritual beings. Too many times we put a focus on the physical and not on the spiritual. And we wonder why if we have it all in the physical that we still are not satisfied and it's simply because you are a spiritual being as well as a physical being. You gotta take care of both. Some people abuse the fire out of their bodies and tell other people they've been getting demonically attacked. And I'm over here like, no, it's the food you are eating in your mouth. Like no one's demonically attacking you. Like it's the buffets, They're, that's demonically attacking you. The third and the fourth portions, that's demonically attacking you. Your fork and your spoon and your knife and you're like, you can't say this stuff. I can. You, some of y'all need to hear it. You are hurting yourself. You are a physical and a spiritual being. Take care of both. Take care of both. Jesus, as soon as he was baptized, it says he was drove, Matthew 4, 1, by the Spirit into the what? Into the wilderness so that he would what? Fast and pray for 40 days. And the first temptation recorded in Matthew's gospel is what? Turn the rock, if you're the son of God, turn the stone into bread. And Jesus said, quoting Deuteronomy 8, 3, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Did he need food? Yes. Spiritually. Spiritually, he knew. We are physical, we are spiritual beings. And therefore, when we look at this text, it points, man, when Jesus is talking here, it's pointing us all the way up to what? Matthew 14, Matthew 15, the feeding of the 5,000 and the feeding of the 4,000. But when you look at John chapter six in particular, which is the feeding of the 5,000, it, it is insane when you think about the parallels happening here. He feeds them and he asks Philip, he says, what are we gonna do? We need to feed these people. And Philip said, check out John six later. Philip said, if I had 200 denarii, if we had that much, not everyone even out here could even get a small smidgen. They've been out there listening to him preach all day long and they were out in the middle of nowhere. You know, they were way out there. No chance to get food, no homes nearby, nobody cooking, like no gumbo, no jambalaya, nothing like that, right? <laughs> Those are normal foods in Israel. You can laugh at that, it's okay. Think about it. They didn't have anything. And so Jesus asked Philip, because he knew what he was going to do, it said, then Andrew says, well, he's been doing some wild stuff so far. Uh, there's a kid over here. He's got a lunchbox, two sardines, and five loaves of fish. That's literally what fish means there. Those are sardines. Those are little bitty fish. Not big fish. Not tilapia. Little bitty fish. And he does what? He gives thanks and he breaks it. And there is so much food that he says afterwards. He says, go collect all the food so that nothing is left over. And they collect 12 full baskets and bring it back in. And every single person there begins to recognize this is the promised one. This is the Messiah. We're, we're gonna, we're, we want him. We're gonna force him to be our king. And so Jesus withdrew from them. And then that's when we see, he tells his disciples, he says, go across the lake. And then that's when the storm happens, right? And then Jesus walks on water and they all think it's a ghost beforehand, right? I mean, this is just wild stuff. You gotta check out John 6, it's really good. But then they get across when Jesus gets back in the boat and the next morning the people realize that he's gone and they go in to find him. And I wanna read something to you, John chapter six, verse 26. In your worship guide on the screen if you don't have it. And Jesus answered them because they're saying like, where did you go, what did you do? And Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs. They did see him, but not because of that, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for food that perishes. God knows you gotta have food. God knows you have needs. You gotta have a job. We know these things. 
But he says, do not spend your entire life devoted to things that will not last you. You're not taking any of this stuff to the grave. It's not going with you. Do not work for food that perishes, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then he said to them, then they said to him, what must we do to, do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. Verse 47, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I give him for the life of the world is my flesh. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. It keeps going in those verses. He says, eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. And it says they were just like, I, we can't. We can't understand this. This is, a, this is too much for us. And he says a lot of his disciples leave him and he points to his other disciples. He says, will you leave me too? And Peter steps up and says, where will we go? We know that you are the one who has the words of God. We know that you're the one. When Jesus teaches us to pray for our daily bread, he teaches us to pray for our needs physically, but he also is teaching us to pray for our needs spiritually. He's pointing forward to when he was going to multiply, what, five loaves, two fish? But then he's pointing even further forward, Matthew 26, when he was going to take part in what? What is now called the Lord's Supper, the Passover meal, and give it its ultimate significance. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 through 26, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was to be betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. What is the Lord's Supper? Which is what we're about to partake in. First and foremost, it is a continual renewal of the covenant that we have made between ourselves and God, which specifically means it's for Christians, for those who are followers of Jesus Christ, who have committed their lives to him. It's a fellowship meal between the saints and the declaration of our reconciliation with God. It's spiritual nourishment for us in the what? In our wilderness. And you're like, but we're not in the wilderness. But we are. It is a table that is set in the presence of our what? And our enemies. In this world, they don't know us but they do not know the one in whom we have believed. It draws our attention to the future great mill in heaven. It is Thanksgiving, hence the reason we call it Eucharist. It's symbolic, but it's also spiritual in nature. And in John Frame, he said it something very close to this. He said this, we take a small piece of bread and a small cup, for we know that our fellowship with Christ in this life cannot begin pair with the glory that awaits us in him. I think that's incredible. Small cup, small piece of bread. But it's pointing us to something so much bigger. So much more glorious in the future. It's a taste which points us to the marriage supper of the lamb, points us to the feast of God that has no end, and that's what we long for. Let us stand, let us pray. Father, we come before you this morning. 
thanking you for the opportunity to take of the communion, to take of the Lord's Supper. Father, I pray this morning that everyone who partakes, Father, would just now reflect in their own lives about their love for you, their devotion to you, doing when we take. We look back at the cross and remember what you have done for us, the great love you have for us, but we also look ahead. Oh, we look ahead.